Hello there. Welcome to the Maker Manager Money podcast, a podcast about entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, founders, business owners, and business partnerships from startups to stay ups to inspire entrepreneurs to keep going and future entrepreneurs to just start. Really, it's a celebration of makers and managers out there making money. My name is Kyle Knowles, and I'm trying to make some cool content at Kiln. That's K I L N, as in nice. Today's the first time recording at Kiln Park City. It's a Sunday morning, and Kiln is turning out to be my second place. For some, it's church or pubs or gyms, but for me, it's Kiln. As they say on their website, Kiln provides working communities that are handcrafted and programmed to elevate lifestyle and performance. Today's guest is Sierra McCleave, an entrepreneur and two times business founder who launched and ran Dottie's Kolaches in Heber City, Utah for nearly a decade, co-founded Thirst Drinks with Utah locations in St. George, Tooele, West Jordan, Bountiful, Mill Creek, downtown Salt Lake City, and you can also find Thirst at the Delta Center. She is now doing startup consulting and investing in tiny house rentals in Tennessee and Zion National Park, and is a fellow podcast producer hosting the Make a Dent podcast. Sierra earned a business administration degree from the former Dixie State University, now Utah Tech University, and won awards as a sales leader in the corporate world before becoming an entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, Sierra. Kyle, wow, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. It's an honor. Super pumped. So, so nice to meet you today, and uh, thank you for coming to Kiln in Park City. Uh, I wanted to start with three questions I haven't really used before on okay. the podcast. Awesome. And I've been thinking about these for myself, my personal life, but they are simply, who are you, why are you here, and what do you want? Hmm. Okay, you might have to remind me of the order okay. or the... Who are you? Let's okay, who am I? One. Wow, we could go so deep with this. I love <laughs> yes, that question. It could be philosophical. It, it could, could be, be anything, right? Wow. Literal. It's got yeah. deep quick. I love it. Uh, well, my name is Sierra McCleave. As you said, I am. I wear many hats, and I've been. Um, it's been uncomfortable for me to try to like narrow one down. So I'm a mom, a wife. I uh, definitely entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, as some would say. I've had to kind of intentionally. Uh, chill out and not start a business recently. I'm, I'm taking my time on, on this next one. And really just loving the process of figuring out really who I am and what's important to me, core values, and taking all that information and just like trying to live my best life with no regrets. So I love it. So um, would you be willing to share your three core values that I assume that you might have Figured out for yourself from Lynn Christian. Yeah. Oh, shout out Lynn. Her. Yeah. Shout out Lynn and badass. Soul Salt. Yep. Oh, true badass. I have, let's see, core values. Um, yes. Give me a second to get there. Uh, definitely something in the form of making memories, no regrets, which I actually got from Friday Night Lights. Did you ever watch that oh, series? Yeah. Yep. Love it. But that that encompasses a lot. I think a lot about like when I'm 80 and not having yeah. regrets. So that guides, that makes, helps me make a lot of decisions actually. So no regrets. Um, leaving people better, leaving them better. I've used that core value at both of my businesses too. And that's something that's just true for me. Like, I think you can, it's just, it, it, it makes you a better human. It gives a better experience to everyone when you try to leave people better than you found them. So that's one. Let's see, what would be my third one? My third one would, I'm trying to think what Lynn would tell me. Harness my Lynn. What, should, what would Lynn say? Probably to live. I'm focusing right now on really living in my true strengths and not my pseudo strengths. Okay. Which Lynn discusses in their book and and in their coaching. And you have you worked with Lynn yet? I've just worked with uh, their book. Okay. Yeah. And, and Lynn was on your podcast, which was an incredible yeah. episode. Holy smokes. But a lot of times looking back, I've, I've realized I've been, I've been working in a lot of my pseudo strengths, which led to burnout because mm. you can be good at something. What I've learned from Lynn is you can be good at something, but it doesn't mean that you should do it all the time because 
you can be good at a lot of things, but it doesn't mean you should make it a business necessarily. Right. doesn't mean you should do it all the time. I mean, sometimes you might need to outsource that so you can live in your true strength. That will empower you and charge you up instead of drain you. So really focusing on that right now. I love that. I love that. Yeah. That's a great, great answer of Thank who you. are you. Uh, so why are you here? I think you, maybe some of the stuff that you just talked about encompass that, but maybe there's a little more mm-hmm. about why are you here? And it could be... It, on this podcast or here on earth or what, whatever. Ooh. You can take it any, any direction mm. you would want. Why am I here? Well, I'm super stoked to be on the podcast. And we got connected by Lynn and just an honor to be speaking with in a, on a platform where fellow entrepreneurs, business owners aspiring can live and breathe and build a community. I think it's so exciting what you're doing, Kyle, really. And uh, having a place for that because that can be a lonely road. Uh, entrepreneurship. So any support and and love we can get there is awesome. So I was excited to be here. And I'm I'm still diving into the bigger why, I think. I know that I'm a builder, a producer, a creator. And you know, you mentioned you graciously mentioned my podcast Make a Dent, but that that's another one of my core values, I think you could say is really how to make a dent in the universe and how to show other people that they can too. It's one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes. There's a, you can YouTube search it. Steve Jobs make a dent. And he's talking about just when you realize you can, the way he phrases it, like you you can poke at the universe and something happens on the other side. You can impact. Yeah. It's basically what he's talking about. So I'm, I'm still diving into that. And that's why I have a personal and business coach and, and trying to align that with as many of the decisions as I can make in my future as possible with what that purpose is and to really to fulfill it and to be fulfilled by it. So, yeah, I love it. I think we're on similar paths in some ways um, that way, although you've been an entrepreneur and I've been in the corporate Mm -hmm. world for all all these years, but I believe, um, you know, one of the questions I was going to get to, and we may as well talk about it now because I already know the answer and it's, uh, that means this is a rhetorical question, but are you more of a maker or a manager? Maker. Yes, for sure. And, and let me just let me just paint the scene here at, at Kiln Park City because Sierra came in with a backpack and there's a gorilla tripod sticking out of it. She's got a light. She's got her laptop. She's got all kinds of gear in here, like content making gear. Mm-hmm. And so it was very easy to identify you as, oh, here's a, a fellow maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I identify with that role a lot. I think there's such value in the manager role. And that is something that I um, like to still really practice. I think I can get better at that, but have you had a chance to read E-Myth Revisited yet? Not yet, but it was recommended by Lynn. One of my favorite books. It is a book that is very tactical, but they talk about three things. So your entrepreneur, your visionary, your manager, and then your boots on the ground person. And in my businesses, I've realized I really thrive well in the visionary, the maker, the producer, the creator. And the employee level, like boots on the ground, doing the tactical work. And the manager is where I uh, have opportunities. I can do it, but I can do it for a very short period of time, get some systems in place, and then go. And all of them are important. Yeah. But I definitely thrive in the maker, producer, creator, visionary type world. Yeah. What, what I've seen with uh, some of the guests too, and especially uh, what, uh, who comes to mind is Terry Allen, who founded Alinko Costumes uh, years ago and recently retired and kind of handed it off to his kids. Mm-hmm. But he was this artist, maker, sculptor, and he invented a new way to do mascot heads, okay. you know, sculpting them and things like that. And he was this artist. But as he grew his business in order to scale, he had to transition to manager. And I... Can you talk just a little bit about that transition as you scaled either at Dottie's or at Thirst and how you, what, what did you do? Did you get someone else to be the manager? Did you do the management? Mm-hmm. How did you get up to speed and what was that transition like? That was a great question because I think a lot of people underprepare for that transition and then they get stuck doing all the roles and get burnt out and then they stop. And that's mm-hmm. why most businesses don't make it past two years, right? five years. So the approach that I did at Dottie's and at Thirst is initially I started the business creating an org chart on how I wanted the business to look in five years. 
You could do it five years or 10 years. And it's some people think that's so silly because your name is literally going to be in every box, <laughs> CEO, <laughs> marketer, whatever, ops manager, yeah. general manager, whatever. But it helps you create a vision for that. And then it, it'll show you then how you're going to need to backfill that position. And so for both of those businesses, yes, I've worked all the positions and then started to backfill at, at Thirst. Uh, I have a business partner there, Ethan, and he did the same thing and I kind of guided him that way. So we started learning everything, boots on the ground, everything at the register drive through level. And then once we got that developing systems checklists, yeah. oh my gosh, checklist systems, and then position agreements so that when you need to graduate to that next level, when you need to graduate to ops manager and then backfill your assistant manager position. Right. You have the position agreement, you have checklists, and then you just keep going. And it sounds easy. Uh, and it actually kind of is if you do it, but if you get behind on that, that can be really challenging. But e Revisited talks about all of that. Really how to do that, well. how to transition. Like how to do it. That's why yeah. I love that book. It's like yeah. tactical. Like you can go do it the next day. It's not just theory, okay. which those theory books are great yeah. too, but that's where a lot of that comes from. But it can be hard and it can be hard to let go. It can be hard for people who are makers, artists, to move into that manager role yeah. for even a temporary time, that can be really hard. But if you can recruit someone yeah. to to yin and yang, to balance you right. out, like that can be really powerful too. And then it can be more joyful, I think, as well. So you got to have a lot of, learn a lot of self, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? You know, just like self-awareness. Yeah. Learn a lot of self-awareness. Yeah. So. so you can recognize maybe some of those unconscious incompetencies. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, man, Early on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something you'll have a magnifying glass on all those things as an entrepreneur and a business owner starter is just all your strengths, which feel great. And all your weaknesses are just under the magnifying glass, which can be great. It can be turned into either a competency at least, yeah. if not a strength, but yeah, it's all under a magnifying glass. So. Okay. Um, yeah. I love, I love discussing this whole maker manager thing mm -hmm. and um, you know, it really comes from a, a VC, uh, Paul Graham, who wrote a, a blog post years and years ago, because he was a programmer, mm -hmm. but he founded some companies and got a lot of money and became a VC, right? So he wrote this blog post simply to explain that makers have a different schedule than managers. Managers are used to it, like every 30 minutes, boom, 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 yes. filling up their schedule. And they want to bring those makers into it, but makers need these large blocks of time. Mm -hmm. to get their stuff done. And that's what they like to do, those large blocks mm -hmm. of time. And so as a manager, understanding the maker is what mm -hmm. he was basically kind of, and, and that's where the name of the podcast sort of mm -hmm. derived from. But this whole idea, like if you're a dual threat, like you are, I can tell, you know, you're a maker, but you can get the management stuff done and then get mm -hmm. someone in place. That dual threat combination for an entrepreneur is money equals money, right? Because mm -hmm. you got, you can be a maker and never make any money because you don't know how to manage the business, right? Or yeah. you can be a manager and not have any in innovative ideas or anything to make. And so you don't make any money. Mm -hmm. So you sort of need, like you said, that yin and yang. So, sometimes it's in you mm -hmm. and sometimes you need to find someone to come oh, be that maker, come gosh. be that manager. 100%. And if you can, and if you have that awareness, you have conversations like that on, on how you both work either theoretically or like one-on-one, -on -one. if you can have those conversations early and regularly and adapt and work on your communication skills, man, it makes a big difference other than just assuming. A lot of people assume like early on, I did the same thing too, assuming that my team understood what it took to be managing the business, to be owning the business and being the visionary. And they had no idea. And how could they? It was it is my job to educate them. And then also ask questions like, how's it for you? What's it like? I haven't ran the window in, you know, months. Tell me what you're hearing. So having learning to have those conversations and not assume is is huge. And if you can find that balance, like you said, man, you can just really fuel the fire. Yeah. So talk about and tell me, how do you, you know, basically deliver that vision to your employees oh, as an owner, founder? Yeah, good question. The biggest one of my biggest drivers for, for going into business that fueled my fire early was company culture. Uh, spending a lot of time in the corporate world that I, I wasn't a huge fan of the culture. I got really frustrated. I, I was super blessed. I learned a lot about sales and stuff, but that's what really fueled my fire. So both of the my businesses, Dottie's and Thirst, are, one of our core values was employee satisfaction. 
that would lead directly to customer satisfaction. So the way that you do that, in my mind, the way that I've done it is from the beginning, you have to have your core values that you're teaching your team and teaching them about the why of the business. Kind of like you asked me in the beginning, what's your why? We would talk about our why on onboarding and even in interviews because you want to weed those people out who may not even catch it early. So you want to talk about it early. Like this is why we're doing this. And we believe it's more than just serving kolaches and drinks at a window or serving cookies and drinks at a window. It's about the customer experience and about how we can change one person's day, honestly, with a smile and their favorite drink made to perfection. And it might sound silly, but I've seen it happen. Like I've seen, had people come through the drive through and be like, I have to tell you, like, this is the worst week of my life. And this little thing made it better, made it easier. And like that, like from a baked good and, you know, a coconut Diet Coke. Like, so explain, it is your job as a manager in my mind and as an owner to get your team on board with that early. And you can't force them to do that. You have to show them. You have to create the core values. You have to live and breathe it with all your actions within. You have to talk about it regularly. You have to show them regularly. Your managers have to show them regularly. And that can be a challenge. It really, it's a whole dedicated, you have to dedicate a lot of time and and, um, intention to that. But the places I've seen do that, it's, you can tell the difference. You can feel the difference when you walk into those places that have, have been able to do that with their team. The interactions are different and you can tell when it's not. Oh yeah. I, I've talked about this with my family is like when we go eat at a restaurant or something and then you're like, this was made with love. Like, especially if you're dealing with franchises, you can tell sometimes that some franchise have that. So this mm-hmm. visionary, someone explaining the core values and the way the food is even served, the way it looks and the way it tastes. It's like, wow, this was made with love. Oh. And then you go to other places and you're like, this was not made with love. No someone love. does not like their job. Mm-hmm. Right. No love. I could, I could, I started to be able to pick up on that when I was about to lose a baker. I could tell by the way their product was coming out. If I had coached them, if I had taken the time to be like, wait, help me understand what's going on. And their product's still not coming out. There's no love there. They're halfway out the door or even with, you know, 75% out the door already. And you can tell, and the customers can tell too. And in food, it's, it's important. And there's a visual representation. And I think in not food, you would, you would judge that by the quality of the work, Mm -hmm. the customer ratings, still the customer experience, the employee ratings, employee satisfaction, so important. And, And you can tell the places that are built on love and like when people care. And so you knew a baker was on their way out because the quality was, I don't know, suffered. Mm-hmm. Basically. Oh, yeah. Yep. I, I've had some conversations with some, too, that were like, this wasn't made with love. Help me understand what's going on. Like something's going on. Right. And and it could it be like just a personal, their personal be, life, something's oh, going on. They're sure, going through a divorce, you know? whatever. Yeah. And a lot. Of, and you have to learn, too, to when, when to have that conversation and when to just let it go, because it yeah. could be one day. Yeah. And you want to watch it and you want to check in, make sure everything's okay. Because after one day, like it can slip like dominoes. You don't want to let it go too far, but that's kind of one of the key, I think, artistries in managing is when to know when to, when to come in heavy. Yeah. Like, Hey, what's going on? Like we need to fix this right away. This is not acceptable. Or, Hey, what's going on? What can I do to help? And let's do some coaching or like, is it just an off day? And still, what can we do to help? That's one thing we talked about at both places early is leave them better was a core value Mm -hmm. of Thirst and Dottie's. And it was one of the conversations we would have would say, if you notice one of your team members is off, check in on them. They don't want to talk about it. That's okay. But like check in on them. And if they're having a rough day, which we all do, and they couldn't just leave it out the door, which we try to suggest, let's try to come here and like, let's make this a a good fun place to kind of like run away from your problems for a minute or like, you know, be alleviated for a minute. If they couldn't do that, do their dishes. Like do something to help make their day a little bit better. And then I believe that will translate to the customer experience as well. Okay. I like that. Leave them better. Leave them better. So it's the customer you're specifically talking, not leave the food better, but leave them better off for having come in and and bought something from you basically. First and yes. And first, I believe it started with our employees. I always tried to hound that at, at Dottie's and Thirst's. Early on, I was more involved with the thirst stuff hands on early on, but leave your team better first, leave them better than you found them. And then the customer, leave them better than you found them. Okay. And that would translate to employees helping each other as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Leaving and caring for like you were a yeah. team and, 
it's interesting. I, um, I'm really big on, on vocabulary. So from the beginning too, we always, I encourage our managers and the fellow employees to use the word team instead of employees. Nice. Because it creates a whole other vibe, right? It does. Like, yeah. man, like Words I'm not matter. gonna I'm not yeah. gonna leave my team hanging if I know that, you know, they their their dog just died and that was like their best friend and like they still have two hours of dishes. Like I'm gonna help. And I think that that really, really makes a difference in the whole environment. That can lead to retention numbers too. For and sure. And all that, but everyone wants a place to feel like home away from home, like kiln. Right? Like kiln, like yes. kiln, Shout like kiln. like you're like you, where you're spending a lot of your time. You want that place to feel like home, and and that's important to me with my businesses. Okay, go ahead and take a drink. I know you were reaching for it. No problem. Give the, a little Tobo Chico. Oh, I'm going to take Tobo some Chico. ASMR. I love it. Maybe that could be a side revenue stream <laughs> ASMR on the money maker Just, money manager money podcast. Um, okay, so and you talked about this when you're talking about who are you and why are you here, but what do you want? Just hone in on that just for a um, little bit more. I think I want to make a difference. And I mean at the at the most important level with my kids, my family. Mm -hmm. That was the most important thing to me and but I, I would like that to outreach a little wider too so that's a, one of the first things that come to mind um you said why am, is it, was it why am i here uh, what do you want what do i want yeah. my adhd went that way that's okay. so that's okay what do i want it sounds like you're going to start another business so you're mm -hmm. working towards that to continue, definitely yeah. to continue making and, and mm -hmm. producing and taking all the lessons I've learned to really continue to make an impact and uh, make a bigger dent, I guess, with okay. the next one. But I'm really being intentional. It's very uncomfortable for me, Kyle, to not be businessing right now, like yeah. full yeah. entrepreneur uh, that has been like white knuckling it for almost a year now, but it's been really good for me to chill out and just be really intentional with what I yeah. want to do next because it's so easy for me to get excited and I have so many ideas. Um, but I want to be really smart with it. My kids are young, so I want, yeah. I want to make sure there's that balance of I can be at sure. home. I don't want to get sucked in and it's very easy for me to get very excited. And then, I mean, as you know, if you, as you've talked to so many people and seen, it's not something a lot of times you can do part-time unless you're intentional. Like, yeah, it's, right. it's like, it becomes one of your kids, right? It becomes your other relationship. And so I'm just really wanting to choose the right thing so that my energy can be dedicated in the right, right places and then make a big, a big freaking splash, okay. a big dent. So nice. Awesome. Um, so, uh, I want to just ask you about was your mom or dad an entrepreneur, someone in the family? Does it run in your family? Good question. I actually was prepping for this by listening to some of your episodes this morning. And I've listened to a few over the last several weeks. Um, and you're doing such a great job. So I knew this question was coming. But this morning was the first time it really hit me that, yes. Um, and I've always answered that question. Yes, my dad had his own welding business growing up. And... As I was thinking about it though this morning, because you had asked another guest, I was like, that really probably was the the seed. Like hearing that growing up, like, oh, my dad owns his own well, and saying that and like hearing just a little bit about it probably made it less foreign and less scary for me to dive in because a lot of people are really nervous about it, like really risk, yeah. um, what's the word, like adverse, yeah, risk adverse. And I haven't really been. And so, yeah, I think so. Uh, my mom did later too. My mom runs a antique and like vintage market thing and she's done exceptionally good at that. And uh, that's been later, but early on, yeah, my dad did. And I always remember, I do remember being very entrepreneurial, but early on, I think it was about the money. I think I told you this in one of our early just phone call conversations, conversations yeah. that it was kind of like, it was like we grew up, not having a lot, but my parents worked really super hard for what we had, and yeah. I'm so grateful. And then so I think early on it was like, I just need to solve a problem and then just make some money. So what's, what problem could I solve? 
And now, though, having had the 10 years of experience behind, it's more about producing and creating. And I'm so glad that that switched because just from what I've seen and heard, when you're just chasing that money, it can be life can become pretty miserable. Like if that's the only thing you're yeah. focused on, it could yeah. be different for other people. But so, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting the different motives of entrepreneurs, too, mm-hmm. because some want maybe more balance. Some want to build that culture like you talked about, Mm -hmm. leave corporate because maybe you didn't like the culture there, want to establish your own. Uh, And it's interesting because um, Jason Steed, I don't know if you listened to that podcast yet, but he outlined three motivations. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One of them was to get rich. And Mm -hmm. uh, he said he's still working on that one. So Mm -hmm. I think if that's the primary driver, um, what I'm hearing from entrepreneurs is don't go into business for yourself then Mm -hmm. because there's a grind and that's not enough to get you over the the hump of not making any money and and taking the risk of of running your own business. Yeah, I really don't think it's enough to get you over that. Um, I think it can drive you for a little a little while, but there has there has to be something else. I think as people look back on it and then have some more realizations, they're like, oh, this is maybe what the other underlying thing was. And I'm glad I'm glad I I kind of realized that because uh, you just like you just wouldn't do what you have to do, especially well. My most of my experience in food, so that's what I can speak to the most. But in food, it's the margins are so slim, yeah, and so it's it can be tough, and it's just not enough to drive you. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, talk a little bit about. I know you know. I don't know if lawn mowing was what you're thinking of as your initial uh, uh, kind of foray into entrepreneurship, but um, talk about life before going into business for yourself. Okay. And, and what that was like growing up, and then going to school and going into the corporate world. Okay. Sure. So definitely, lawn mowing was like my first entrepreneurial thing. I got maybe one customer, but I. I had this really dope poster I made in clip art. Nice. Oh man, it was sick. And I used card stock for my little cards and I maybe got one. It was probably my mom was my my only client, but, but I always kind of had that mindset. And then in high school, uh, same thing, just always working. I worked, I started working at like 15 and bless my mom's heart. She would drive me until I got my license out to this little sandwich shop. So like I didn't, I wasn't afraid of working and I did want that money to like have some stuff to, to go spend it on. I think any kid wants that. But in high school, I remember I, I, these kids were into like AV, they were into video and they would video, I knew they were videoing like the football games, maybe for the coaches to review. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I want to learn iMovie. Then I realized I didn't really want to move or learn iMovie. They were already good at it. But I was like, why don't we just like for these last couple of games of their senior year, why don't we sell the tape to the parents? You're already videoing it. So I talked to them who were already doing the video and I got permission from, I don't know who, I think I got permission. I don't know. <laughs> and then at like uh, the homecoming game, uh, I set up a little table and just offered to sell a copy of the DVD to parents and they paid me then. And then I had to go figure out how to like make the video and pull it. And it was, the production was probably absolutely horrible. Cause it was like one camera yeah. up way high. You couldn't yeah. like, it wasn't like multiple yeah. cameras, but that was another endeavor where I was just like, how can I put some people together and like make some yeah. money and, and figure this out. And did you just put all the, all the games for the whole year on one DVD or what? No, what this was, was like, I think I just did it for the homecoming game. game. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then it was probably really hard and I don't think I ever dabbled in that again, but, yeah. but I was definitely always kind of thinking about stuff like that. Um, and then I got, I got a really good job when I was in high school still. no, I got a really good job when I was in college that was sales. Um, so that was my first intro into kind of corporate world. Mm -hmm. And I was making good money part time. And that led me to be able to buy a condo, um, with some help of some family. But I was like, in the back of my mind, I was like, why? I mean, this condo's for sale right next to my mom's. If I got roommates, I wonder if I could like make this happen. And so at 19, I bought this condo and rented out the rooms and made more than the mortgage. So that was cool. I learned a lot there. And uh, anyway, continued to have this great sales job, learned a lot of sales skills, but really got tired of the culture and knew that I wanted to do something different. Always knew growing up, I wanted to own a business, not a bakery, (laughs) 
that never came up, but that was my first one. And people always ask like, oh, you wanted to be a baker? No, but I always wanted to, to own a business. And so, yeah, just after finally getting really sick and tired of the culture there, but I had a little bit of money. Um, I had, I, do you want me to dive into how I started let's, my Let's one? dive into it because what's funny, and I just want to just throw this out there because I just finished reading this book called What They Don't Teach You in Harvard Business School. And the, his last chapter is on entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And he says that 99% of people should work for someone else, you know, it's a very rough grind. But one of the things he literally calls out is people that want to say, go into business for themselves. So the first thing they think of because they like food or because they like restaurants, it's to do a restaurant or some kind of food thing. And he's like, this is a bad idea, but you actually made it happen. So yeah, go right into Dottie's. But the difference is, is I never wanted to be a baker. I think that's what the point of that was is, is if I had, I play guitar too. And I did think about taking a career as a, a studio musician. So I I studied art all before I switched over to business. I was going to be a studio musician or a producer. So I kind of was following that thing of my interest, then going to lead to something to make a career out of. And luckily, as like my second or third year into like the art program, I was like, I don't want to do this forever. I want to play guitar for fun. Um, I had some other scholarships for some other instruments that I never wanted to play again, uh, really. What, um, what instruments? Just I'm I randomly. Just this is so weird, Kyle. I randomly got a scholarship for bassoon, but I had never played bassoon. How do you get a scholarship for bassoon? Never playing. You play bassoon. saxophone first, okay. and then you get looked at by a college that really needs a bassoon player. Okay. So I, I was, and they say, th- and there's, it's an easy transition for a saxophone player. It actually, it's not too easy. But I okay. did start a little bit in high school because we needed one on a song, and so getting t- used to the double read, and then the fact that I could play really, I just they needed a bassoon way bad. And I'm grateful for that. Like, I'm so grateful for that. And actually, I would play the bassoon again because it actually sounds really dope when you can really play it. But you did go to, you literally went to college on a scholarship to play bassoon. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that so So weird? No one, not not many people know that. (laughs) So, so I'm, I'm in there. I I go for a few years and then I realize like, I do not like, no, I don't want to go play bassoon every day. I have much more appreciation now, but I want to play guitar for fun. And I was really like always thinking about business ideas. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take some business classes. And I was like hooked. It was like, I couldn't get enough. And then school was fun then, especially at my, like my latter year. Junior and senior, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Where I could really dive into some stuff I Mm -hmm. wanted to. And I had really great, really great professors down. uh, It was Dixie State at the time. It's Utah Tech now. And anyway, so I think the difference there is even though I started with a bakery, is I never wanted to be a baker. And that gave me this other perspective, this ownership business perspective that helps a lot of people who grow up baking and want to bake and then become bakers, I think have a challenge with that. Like it's no longer fun because you have to move into that manager role. Then you're not baking anymore. And pretty pretty soon you hate it. And that's unfortunate. That's really, really hard. Might not happen with everyone. Unless you're Tammy Stagel. Oh, unless you're Tammy Stagel, for sure. But she wasn't literally a baker before. She was she an started, architect. She, she was a right. She yeah. but she liked baking. She did. Maybe. And she just was on the good. side, but that she turned. Yeah, that's a rare. That's a phenomenon. And I think yeah. that, but she has that mindset of design mm. and architecture building, right. and right. so I think that's where that comes into play for her. She is one of my top five favorite people of all time, Kyle. I love Tammy so much. And there's so much to be learned from her. So anyone check her out, Ruby Snap Cookies in Salt Lake City. And Bite Me Industries. And Bite Me Industries on Instagram. Yeah. Incredible. An incredible maker. Oh, my gosh. But so then... Oh, I forgot where I was. Sorry. So you were... You okay. were... You were... Um, you didn't want to be a baker, mm-hmm. but you ended up being a baker. I so, so I was down south. I was working splits at the yeah. job I didn't like, but I was making good money and... I mean, they taught me a lot. It was it was a great learning. And this experience. was sales. It was sales. Okay. So I was I was working split. So I was driving four times a day past a drink company that started in St. George called Swig, and I watched them go from no cars for four years to twenty cars in about a year because of these mommy bloggers that had started blogging about Swig. And I was like, what in the crap is happening? Yeah. Because I saw the line literally zero to twenty. So that's when I decided I was originally just going to do a drink shop. It wasn't going to be a bakery. I was going to do a drink shop. I counted cars. I heard, I just like went and listened to figure out average revenue per order. I tried to figure out how much the cups were. So I reverse engineered and tried to figure out like what their costs were, probably what their profit margin was. 
And I was like, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. And so originally I was going to do a drink shop. And the drink shop, I was the place I was looking to place this drink shop up in a small town in northern Utah was serving kolaches at the time. It's a Czech pastry. I'd never heard of them. And I ate one. My first one was a turkey pepper jack. And I went back to St. George and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought he put something illegal or very <laughs> special in the dough because I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it ended up being an opportunity where I could buy the recipe and the equipment with the building to start my drink shop. And that was going to be my differentiator because at the time, this was 10 years ago, the only thing soda shops were producing or other than their drinks were cookies or sugar cookie. Okay. And for those listening who aren't in Utah, there's a, there's a craze <laughs> with, with soda shops. It's soda with coconut and pomegranate and it's flavored soda and cream. And it is actually really delicious, but it is huge here and it's not many other places. But at the time they were only serving a cookie. So I thought this was a handheld fresh. It could be breakfast or lunch. You don't, you need a napkin. It's enclosed. It looks like a dinner roll, but there's all this goodness inside. And so it was going to be a drink shop with kolaches. And then we just started rolling October of 2013. And so the as you went on, did drink supersede kolaches or was it... Revenue wise, was it fifty mm. fifty or like how does how does that work? Good question. Because a kolache is more than a drink. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Costs more, but which, which was were I, you fifty fifty on that or? What, what I do you pushed think? the drink. So my first menu, I should we should we should float in my very first menu. It was a mess. Oh, that'd be it's awesome. A, an example of what not to do. <laughs> but we had shaved ice on there, kolaches, oh, wow. soda mixers. It was this huge menu. Don't do that. <laughs> Anyone listening? Narrow. Find your 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 niche, like find your thing yeah. and just go think about in and out. Yeah. Think yeah. about it like that. But it was, we had all of that in there and, and I was pushing the sodas and I realized after about probably two years that the kolaches were the, f the more exciting niche thing. We were the only kolache shop in Utah for a period of time. There's more now. And, but people in Texas know about them because there's a large Czech community in Texas and people in some parts of the Midwest and like some Bohemian communities and Czech communities there know about them, but no one in Utah did. So we had to educate. And once people knew about them, they lost it. So I kind of, I stopped marketing sodas, but I still offered them. So the kolaches took over and we were selling them by the, um, we'd sold them in like a mill of two or by the half dozen or dozen. And in Texas, that's what you get them. You go into like, they're in like all the gas stations and you mm. go and buy them a dozen, like a, like donuts. Basically. Just anywhere in Texas or certain parts of Texas? Um, so. You can see them a lot in Houston, for sure, um, kind of down that way. Okay. And then uh, West Texas is probably the most famous place in Texas. There's a place called the Check Stop. And so anyone there, you have to stop there. They're so good. It's like a 24-hour kolache production facility, wow. and they're always fresh. And a traditional kolache um, or kolache, depending on where you're from, it's a slightly sweet dough with a, just to give your audience an idea, slightly sweet dough, almost looks like a Danish, but it's way better. You push down the middle and there's fresh fruit, raspberry or raspberry cream cheese, blueberry. And that's a, that's an actual traditional kolache. The version that we added was kind of a Texas version where we- Like savory or- Yep, yeah. savory. We flattened out the dough, put sausage egg cheese, cream cheese, bacon, jalapeno, barbecue pulled pork, close it up like a dinner roll in that same, it's a very special dough. And then you bake it up and it's poofy and delicious and handheld. And so that's kind of the savory version. It's technically called a klobosniki or klobosnik, but people just call them a kolache down there. But to any Czech people listening, I'm sorry, those are the correct terms. <laughs> <laughs> so kolache was usually just a sweet mm -hmm. version. Yes. Okay. And then they have a different name for kind of the savory. Yes. And they flatten it out more than it's, it's less puffy or. Um, in Texas, like the kind of the Americanized version is it's it's really a soft dinner roll. So you have a layer. If you make them well, you have a layer of dough on mm -hmm. top, layer of dough on bottom, and then all those meats and cheeses inside. And it's it's really soft and fluffy. Um, not everyone makes them like that, but that's how they, in my mind, should be. But okay. I am biased. So that's so I stopped focusing on the drinks for a long period of time at Dottie's, but I still had the scratch ditch. I really still wanted to like go win the soda game because I learned so much. I knew how to do it. And that's how Thirst was born. Um, out of wanting to still go compete in that arena that started to get very 
competitive pretty darn quick. And right now you can go to any city in Utah and find it, probably at least two soda shops. For but sure. at the time it was a little yeah. bit, there were, there were less, but. Can we, I just want to take a tangent here for a second. Can you, can you explain to the audience, especially if they're outside of Utah, why a soda shop basically, right? Mm. Specialty soda drinks. Yeah. Like it. Why is that so big in Utah? Okay. So this is my theory on why it's so big in Utah. Diet Coke is huge here. Uh, we are very, very much a family state, I think you could safely say, within reason. Like, it, it, families are big here. Therefore, there's lots of moms loving their Diet Coke and dads. But it's also quite religious. And I think that this is my theory on it. Most people here, a lot of people here who are of a certain religion don't drink a lot of alcohol or coffee. But they do drink soda. <laughs> Yes. And so it kind of became, I really think it kind of became like this culture's coffee shop. And it was like, it was their fix to get their caffeine and their sweet treat. And like, it is really delicious. Like if, yeah. if it sounds really weird to a lot of people outside of Utah, um, but if you like soda, um, you would like these drinks. And so I think that's why, that's why it popped off. And you'll see that, you'll see the demographic of where a lot of people of this particular religion uh, are, there's density in population yeah. and soda shops work. Okay. I know, I don't, I don't, I don't know why you're being ev evasive about no, the religion, but could, we'll just throw say, it out. It's, it's Mormons, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and what's funny is I had a boss several years ago that told me one time, he said, you know how you can tell the difference between a Mormon and a non-Mormon hmm. in Utah, the temperature of their caffeine. Oh, yes. There you go. And I just See, that that stuck with up. me forever. And that kind of sums up. I'm you know, now going to steal that as, as and, the explanation. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's so, perfect. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, um, for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's kind of their bar. Kind it of is. Where to go to, yeah. you know, to, get, a, to mm -hmm. get a yummy drink. Yep. And it works really well. And I, I've always thought, I do think that it will still work with people that drink a lot of soda. So I've been so intrigued. I would love to have put one in like Austin. Because yeah. Dr. Pepper's is really huge down in Texas and still, so are Bucky's. Are you familiar with Bucky's? No. It's like the most incredible gas station you'll ever go to, Kyle. Wow. Like it's like, I it's an experience. It's like Disneyland yeah. for gas stations. And a lot of people are going to Bucky's to get their drink anyway. So I think it could work there. Okay. Um, so that's a pro tip for anyone who uh, is in the soda shop game. I'd look at Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Austin. Look at expanding <laughs> yeah. franchise down in Austin. I think it'd be it'd be yeah. interesting to see what happens. And Austin's weird too, right? So you could do a little funky. You could go funky with it and bring more people in. I think, but anywhere soda works, I think that it could. But you would have to be very strategic on your marketing. Whereas in Utah, yeah. or places where there are a lot of uh, Mormon population, then you don't have to do as much because people get it. Yeah, and they love it. Yeah. Okay. So back to, to Dottie's kolaches. First of all, one question I have for you. So, so you were trained on, to make, on how to make them because, so this business existed, at least a kolache. The kolache place existed. Yes. Existed. It was not called Dottie's. No. You came in, basically took over mm -hmm. the business, added drinks, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe started expanding the kolaches. I or, did. And then how did you, how did you come up with the name Dottie's? Ooh. Where is Dottie's kolaches come from? I love from? that question. Okay. Yes. So I came in and the person there was doing a few sweet kolaches, but he wasn't doing any traditional. Traditional kolache is poppy seed, prune, apricot. He wasn't doing any traditionals um, for whatever reason. So I learned the recipe, but I really wanted to do it right. So my sister and I, we started that business together and we flew to Texas and spent a weekend and ate like 80 kolaches, like tasted them, took notes, Googled how to reverse carbo overload. <laughs> like I think we're taking like apple vinegar shots. That doesn't work, by the way. <laughs> Probably don't do that. And then we came back and I'm like, okay, I, I fixed the menu. I was like, we have to have traditional on here if we're going to serve it. And then expanded the breakfast and lunch menu because you can put so much good stuff in there. doesn't mean you should, but you can put so much good stuff in there. So we expanded the menu and then I would eventually narrow it down, kind of like my entire menu. <laughs> I got rid of shaved ice and stuff and really focused on the kolaches and then I would narrow the kolache menu down. So, and they, and, and I just wanted it to be really good if we were going to do it. So that helped a lot traveling out there and doing some research and talking to people and even buying some old Czech cookbooks. And then um, we called it Kolaches on Main for a while. 
And But I wanted something that would incorporate the sodas because still at that time, in the first two years, I was still focused on sodas. I didn't want it just to be kolaches at that time. And for me, I decided I wanted to have like a 40s, 50s theme. Mm -hmm. When we remodeled the building, I wanted to kind of go a little industrial and I was thinking Rosie the Riveter type type thing. I've always loved old sailor sailor tattoos. So like the swallows mm -hmm. and like the anchors, just like that. It'd be called American traditional tattoos, I know now. But I always loved that style. And, and I thought that, so that 40s, 50s theme kind of worked with that. I decided on having a swallow as the logo. It has a lot more meaning than just the bird and that I like the tattoos. We could dive into that if you want. But, and then um, I loved a league of their own growing up, you know, Gina Davis, mm -hmm. Dottie. And that, that name fit the forties and fifties theme. Her name in the movie was Dottie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And my grandma, my grandma's name um, was kind of close to that. Her name was Dolly. I thought about dedicating it to her, but I didn't know it was going to happen. I didn't know if it would eventually sell. I didn't want it to be that personal. So it was kind of close enough to my grandma's name. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want it to be her name, but it fit the theme. And then eventually it's so f like people then eventually called it Dotties instead of just Kalachis. That's what people were calling it before. And that's been so fun and, and, uh, to kind of build that up and, and watch that be built. It's been really, really fulfilling. Okay. So how long did it take you from first kind of taking over the business to getting to the point where you had a menu, things were running smoothly? And it was called Dottie's Kalachis. Things were running smoothly. That's a great question, <laughs> Kyle. Um, or better than at the sure. start, I guess. I think it probably, it, it took it took me two years, maybe two and a half to really launch the Dottie's name. It took me like a year to decide. I was kind of, it took me a long time to really decide and then get the logo done and then actually get the, the uh, sign up and stuff like that. And then from there, I used the theme and the style sheet that we had created to create the menus. So it probably took two years, two and a half years, and then I would refine it and then kind of tweak it and, and just keep honing in on, on what I was learning. Like, like don't serve shaved ice and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like so eliminate slimming down the, the, the slimming menu, down the menu yeah. and really get it focused. And then, um, it probably took though to really get it running smoothly where I wasn't having to do the day to day, but I was still very, very involved. Like it took a long time that took five or six years to really get it going. And I, I just, I worked in it up until that point. And then when we started thirst, I had to divide my time a little. So I had to get my systems and checklists mm -hmm. really refined so I could step away for a day or two and have it still run and go help out with thirst, getting that going. And, but it takes longer. It'll take longer than you think normally, unless you're really prepared or experienced. And I was neither. I was a little naive, which was good because I think the naivety helped me <laughs> not be scared and to just be determined and push forward. Because otherwise, it's. I mean, it's hard. It's not easy. I think I would have probably not done it if I would have known how much work it was going to be. But I'm okay. super grateful I did. Okay, two quick questions, and then we'll move into thirst. Sure. What was your favorite kolache, and what was your favorite drink? Sausage, egg, cheese. I ate like every single day if I was going savory. Um, I like chili cheese dog too. And I don't like hot dogs, but those two top savory. And then my favorite sweet one, because I can't leave that out, would probably be chocolate cream cheese. It's so good. Um, and we do we did cinnamon rolls too. Those were just the probably the top seller of all of it. Right. Um, love the cinnamon rolls. With the same dough. Mm -hmm. Of the kolache dough. Yeah. Slight, slight tweak, but pretty okay. darn close. And then um, my favorite drink, my favorite soda mixer that I created would probably be Johnny and June. So it is a Sprite base with tiger's blood and coconut cream. It's really good. And you can do it with Mountain Dew as well. But um, that was probably my favorite. Wow. It sounds delicious. It's really good. It is really, really <laughs> good. I love Tiger's blood. Yeah. And I can only imagine it with Sprite. And uh, what, what else did you put with that? Coconut cream. Coconut cream. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. That sounds yeah. delicious. Okay. So what year are we at where you're, you're, you're starting to go and, and split your time into th to thirst? And it's not thirst drinks. Is it just thirst? It's just called thirst. It's Technically on paper, it's thirst drinks. Okay. Okay. But, but we call it thirst. It right. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, like the legal... What? Registry is thirst drinks, okay. um, but we just kind of go by thirst now. So that was 2016 when we started thirst and it okay. was 
So I started Dottie's at 2013 and 2016, we started Thirst and uh, it was me and my business partner, Ethan. He was really young at the time, like in high school and contacted me. I had this shaved ice shack for sale and he contacted me, wanted to do shaved ice. And so just like a brief story on how we started, um, I told him I was open to business inquiries and he was like 17 or 18 at the time and couldn't afford like this $10,000 shaved ice shack. He's like, Hey, would you be a partner with me? And I was like, Oh, sure. I've done shaved ice. So we partnered up for two summers. And then I was like, look, I don't really want to do this anymore. Cause it's not really making that much money. We would have to do 32. Either we're going to do 32 of these shaved ice shacks and you're now, he would have now been like 19 or I do a drink shop because I know everything there. And I still want to like go beat the pants off a swig uh, just for fun, <laughs> just competitive like that. Um, and it just, so happened that he had a roommate that his parents owned this building in downtown Salt Lake with a drive through in downtown Salt Lake, like not the best area, but it had a drive through. And so we were like, okay, I was pregnant at the time. So we had a meeting. We actually had a meeting at a fizz because we were doing some competitor <laughs> research, had a meeting at a fizz. I was pregnant and I was like, look, man, if we do this, I'm not going to be able to be boots on the ground every day. Like, I can come up with the brand, the strategy. I can come up with the structure. I can come up with everything to get going. I can come up with the marketing strategies. I'm not going to be boots on the ground. Like I'm a miserable pregnant lady as it is just anytime I'm pregnant. And then I'll have this child that I want to spend time with. And he was like, all right. And I mean, he's, he's such a hustler. He really, he really is. And he just really grabbed the bull by the horns. And that made our I think having that conversation and those clear expectations up front Mm -hmm. really helped our partnership because we are actually are very, very similar and in, in more circumstances that would have caused more problems, but having that conversation up front. So that's something I would encourage anyone just and have it on paper and probably don't go into business with family if we're just giving like really quick tips. But, um, so we started in 2016 and probably for the first three or four years, I was pretty involved started kind of weaning off as it as he got more experienced and as I could just kind of like let go a little bit more but um so yeah that's how we started so we started downtown Salt Lake 1300 South right by the Bees Stadium where the Bees play baseball and it, it was just it was a whirlwind it was fun it was like uh it was really fun coming up with that branding and logo our roof is orange like our colors are orange and white a nod to the orange crush that I grew up loving nice. uh, when I was younger. And that's our, our demographic would, would feel that too for our target demographic. And so we have this bright orange roof downtown Salt Lake. And I remember telling Ethan one time, we're, we're looking at the drive through making the drive through plan. And I was like, we need to plan on 20 cars. And he's like, well, are you like, do you really think we'll get 20 cars in line? And I was like, yes, if we, if we, if we do this, like we're going to do it right. And we need to plan on 20 cars because just being able to fit three cars isn't going to work. It'll work for like a minute. And um, we have definitely had more than 20 cars in line and we've had probably more than a hundred and 150 in some of our grand openings. And that's been the coolest thing. Like one of the highlights wow. just to see like that come to fruition that's because so of cool. like all that hard work, dedication and the hard work and dedication of Ethan and the team. That's so cool. So did you get initially down in that location? Did you get a lot of traffic from people going to the baseball games? We did. And uh, we did a lot of guerrilla marketing for that too. Like we would go and flyer every single car. Nice. Because originally people didn't really know. Because I mean, we didn't, they could get the gist of it because our slogan was happy drinks and treats. So they could be like, oh, it's kind of like a swig or or whatever. Um, Let me get a drink. But we did a lot of on-foot marketing to get those people to come over and walk over. And eventually we did. And some people would park on our street to get to the game anyway. So kind of extended our hours to make sure we were open for them and stuff. And um, just really going – we did a combination of guerrilla marketing. And then once we really started figuring out social media marketing, those two helped. But originally it was a lot on foot. Like it was taking stuff to every single bank in, in a certain radius just to get the mm-hmm. word out just to start the brand recognition, working deals with the car dealerships around there and stuff like that too. And just a lot of hustle, <laughs> a lot of hustle from Ethan and the team for like boots on the ground stuff for sure. And then um, just kind of trying to always be ahead of, of what's next. Like, okay, well, 
when we do this, then what are we going to do next? And when we get this much money, <laughs> what piece of equipment are we going to upgrade and just like really, really grinding it out? And we were in that location for, let's see, I think about four years. And then we opened, we were able to open our second in Mill Creek. And that was huge right before 2020 hit. Okay. Yeah. No, I wanted to get there with, so 2013, uh, Dottie's Kalachis, mm-hmm. 2017, 2016, 2016, thirst, thirst going, things are going really well. And then something happens in 2020 mm-hmm. and, and how did COVID affect Dottie's Kalachis and thirst? Good question. It was really like, we were actually super blessed. It helped our business. And like, I feel, I still feel weird saying that out loud. There's still like some survivor's guilt in there a little bit, honestly, because so many, that wasn't the story for so many restaurants, but for places with a drive through that could adapt and pivot very quickly, which we did, it, it ended up being really good, but it, we didn't know, like we, I was scared. Like we had signed the contract on Mill Creek. Um, the, lo- the location, the real yeah, estate. Yeah. With all of this kind of, let's see it was like starting to happen. I just didn't know what was going to happen. And Ethan was like, we signed it. I'm like, well, we might need to get out of it. Cause like, I don't know, Yeah. but luckily we pushed through and, and, um, but yeah, for like a, a week and specifically, yeah, like a week for both places, it was really scary. Cause I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if we we're going to be forced to shut down, mm-hmm. but luckily we, we were able to stay open. Um, all of our team just hustled so hard to, to keep that afloat and, um, I mean, staffing was hard. Everyone knows how hard that was. But I think pe- what we saw there is people needed some type of comfort of some type of normalcy. Mm-hmm. And a freshly your freshly baked good, your freshly baked cinnamon roll that tastes the same as it did three months before this hellhole of lockdown yeah. was comforting to so many people. And that, that like, it still gives me chills. Same thing with the drinks and treats at, at Thirst. Um, cause you couldn't go inside anywhere. So... Just the drive throughs crushed. And at Thirst, we were very fortunate. Ethan and Rachel were amazing and had been working already on an app integration. And we launched that app integration like two weeks before things hit. And that allowed curbside pickup. Wow. And uh, like delivery, integrated delivery. And that just crushed the, the curbside pickup, really just crushed too. So that was really fortunate timing. And um, the staffing was so difficult. It was so hard because you had to be, I mean, if you're a good manager, you had to be understanding that people either needed or wanted to go um, quarantine. Yeah. Uh, and so you just had to like adapt and just do it with less people and try to get people time off when you could and work as many shifts as you could. But I feel really lucky that we were able to thrive in that time when so many people didn't. So did you, what, did you end up being boots on the ground during COVID? With for thirst. sure. Um, I helped out with thirst when needed, but I was mostly up at Dottie's. Okay. Mostly up at Dottie's being boots on the ground and trying to take shifts. And you know, like our, our baking staff was short staffed or they needed to take it out. So I'd, I'd be baking. And that was hard time. Like that was a really hard time. One time I remember like probably the closest time I've ever been to just losing it and shutting it down was... I just had a baker come back from quarantine. They decided to self-quarantine because they had some medical stuff. And I was like, that is totally fine. They came back for like a week or two and then quit the day before we had beignet weekend, which is always huge, like is crazy. It it was really busy at that point. And I was only doing it uh, either on the weekends or like once a month. Mm -hmm. At Dottie's, this is before we rolled out full-time beignets at Thirst, which is why they have full-time beignets at Thirst is because we started them at Dottie's. But she quit and I was like, and she had just come back. And I, I mean, everyone's going to do what they're going to do, whatever. But I like, I, I was like, how, I can't do this. <laughs> like, I'm going to have to go do this two days in a row, baking plus like working most of the day. Mm-hmm. And so I remember it was like probably midnight and I was doing a lot of, I think I was doing 75 hard at the time too. I was doing a lot of fitnessy things and I just went on like this intense run, like, and just ran it out like as 
fast as I could for probably like half a mile because I can't sprint very long. I don't know, but I don't know how long I made it. Probably not half a mile. And at the end of that, I was just like, okay, I can do anything for 24 hours. So just make it through the next 24. So I ran my butt back home, got a little bit of sleep and just pushed for 24 hours and um, made it past that. And then I think that challenge helped for other challenges in the future, but that was one of the biggest ones for sure. Wow. It must've been so hard for um, so many employees, so many different types of, I mean, healthcare, we're talking about healthcare, but oh, yeah. supermarkets, food places like Thirst and, and Dottie's. So um, tell me about Dottie's and then the subsequent years until sort of sunsetting Dottie's and mm -hmm. the decisions behind that and um, maybe accelerating the growth of Thirst mm -hmm. and, and how that, how that, uh, journey kind of went for you. Sure. So I officially closed down Dottie's like officially last fall. So it was be fall of 2022. And probably for three years prior to that, I knew I needed to shift a little bit. Um, I knew I was imbalanced. I kind of refer to it now as I learned that you have one water of pitcher as a human being. Like you have one pitcher of water in this, I guess it's an analogy. I don't know. One pitcher of water and your major stuff in your life are your plants. So like your family is a plant and your businesses are for sure a plant. Mm -hmm. But you only have one pitcher of water. So for me, for a long time, I had family, kids and husband, Dottie's, um, thirst. And even also my relationship with Ethan is very much an important, very, mm -hmm. very important part of all that. It ties into the thirst one, but it's still almost like its own marriage. Don't want that to sound weird, but it really is. Like you have to communicate kind of yeah. on that level. And I just knew I was, I didn't have enough water to go around. And so I knew it was imbalanced. My kids were growing up. I didn't want to live with that regret of, yeah. you know, I'm 50. And what did I do when they were little with that time? So I knew I needed to transition some things. So very, very involved in thirst for three or four years. And then Ethan and I both decided it was probably both something that we wanted to kind of renegotiate the ownership and like a partnership there. So we worked on that for a year. That was really hard to go back and forth there. Uh, we learned a lot, made it through really well. And so just kind of shifted the dynamics of the partnership and kind of the roles and responsibilities, which has been really good. So I went from majority to a minority owner um, and he went to majority, which is good. That's what he wanted to. And then I, I knew I still needed to do this thing with Dottie's and either it was either sell it and wait another year or transition. So I didn't want to wait a year. Once I decided and kind of realized like, not, I need to do something different and I'm ready. Um, I decided to do, try to do wholesale for like a year. Um, and it, it, I was going to actually onboard and either sell it or bring on a partner, kind of like my relationship with Ethan. Cause that worked really well. I work really well in that environment where I can lead and guide and mentor and strategize and do what I really know how to do for the first six months to two years and really get it going and then do something different. I work really well in that, in that realm. So I was going to do that in Dottie's and had a few things not pan out with kind of the partner I was looking at working with, but ended up doing wholesale for a year. So wholesale is like when you would, I would package up, I'd do frozen, take and bake kolaches and send them to coffee shops are perfect. Mm -hmm. Coffee shops want to do coffee. I don't want to mess with food, but they want to have good food. So I do coffee shops, did that for about a year, um, kept on one of my staff at Dottie's, closed retail the year before. That was really hard. I made like a whole video. Mm. It was emotional, but it was good. We had su such amazing support from the community. That's what made it so hard and like the team, but it was the right decision. And then after about a year of working wholesale, I was like, and working with Lynn, Lynn really helped me. I just, I have such a belief in a coach. How, um, did, she, how did she help you with that transition then? Um, helping me really realize my core strengths and what filled me up, what charged me up, what filled my batteries mm -hmm. and how everything I was doing every day with Dottie's was depleting it. It wasn't my, it wasn't my high level, productive, happy, charged up, energized zone. I was, it was a pseudo strength that I was just forcing mm -hmm. to happen because I was a little bit, it was hard to let go. It's, it really is like your child. And so <clears throat> huge shout out to Lynn for helping me with that. And once I realized I was like, okay, now there's like a lot of peace with that and I'm ready for the next chapter and to go learn about it. It was really hard because the community loves it. Um, I still, I still think there's probably some opportunity where someone might come along and pick it up, pick it up and buy it. Um, but I didn't want to wait another year to market it 
that's how long it, that's, that's how long it can take. So it's still for sale. Yeah. Anyone yep. listening that's yes. interested in starting a kolache shop, reach out. Like reach out, serious inquiries. We can talk about all the all the possibilities there. There's a lot that you could do, but so I'm hopeful for that. But even if not, I'm I'm just ready for the next chapter and take all those lessons I learned because they're just so significant and do it and work on the next thing. So you spent the past year kind of transitioning sort of, you know, well, longer than that, as far as Dotties go, you know, you exited that a little while, you know, what, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And then now minority ownership in Thirst. Correct. So what have you been doing? I've been figuring out what I'm going to do. I've been focusing on family time. It's been so fun. I got like a real summer with my kids last summer. How old are they? 10 and 6. Okay. And I get a real summer with them this year. Uh, Christmas, like holidays have been incredible because holiday time for us in a bakery, it's th Thanksgiving and Christmas Busiest are time. huge. Right. And so that's yeah. just been incredible to breathe through that and to really take that in and to like cherish those moments. So I've been doing that. And then I can't, I can't not dabble. So I've been doing some real estate investing and some, I've been working on a tiny house project for the last three years. That's up and rolling now, tiny house rentals in Zion and getting ready to launch some in Tennessee. So that's nice because I can, I'm interested in it. I can focus on it for a little bit and then I can go do my podcast. I relaunched my podcast, which we've talked about. So all of these things that give me energy, that align with that, that fuel me up, that allow me to meet people and um, continue to build something, but it doesn't require all of my time and energy. Yeah. And saving that for like the next thing, if I if I choose to transition to something like that, which I eventually will, but just choosing the right thing and I've been doing some. Another fun thing I've been doing to fill my cup and to scratch that itch of like wanting to create is business consulting, which has been huge, because I can take what I've learned and coach or consult, and have them go execute, and then have more energy for when they come back and the next step. Yeah. So it's like um. It's like that partnership that I thrive really well in, but I'm not, I'm not an actual partner. Yeah. That's been really cool. That's super cool. So um, I know we've uh, um, exhausted most of our time here. Just a few more questions for you. Sure. What's the book you recommend to people the most? If we're talking strictly entrepreneurship, for sure, E Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. And then, can I do one more? Because yeah, I've said that one already. Sure. I might have to say two. How to Win Friends and Influence People, solid, recommend that one. Um, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. You read that one yet? I haven't, but I have it on my bookshelf. So that one, I think, and then probably The Dichotomy of Leadership after that. I haven't finished that one yet, but that really does help you balance out that extreme mindset of taking ownership of everything. It's huge. It was important for me. It was impactful for me. That's mm -hmm. why I recommend it, to shift my mindset from blaming my team for doing something wrong to blaming myself. And there does have to be a balance. Like you have to hold people accountable, but most of the time when people are pointing the finger at their team or their employees, as they likely might call them, uh, they need to be pointing them back at themselves because there's something that they missed. They're not supporting them in some way. So that was really, really impactful for me. And I think that that mindset is just valuable. So I can't wait to check those <laughs> books out. You have to tell for me sure. what you think. Yeah, for sure. So just a lightning round, favorite candy bar. Oh my gosh, I, this is going to sound so dumb. I just, I've been really eating built bars for like three years. Okay. I, I just have been on a fitness kick the last four. It really helped nice. save my mental health. And so I don't re eat, eat a lot of candy bars, but hang on, let me, I can dig deep. Candy bar. If Go I back to your choose. childhood, something. Yeah, yeah, come on. You talked about Orange Crush. You've got to have a, a, a candy bar in there I know, somewhere. I know. You know, I, I used to love those whatchamacallits. Okay. Do they still make those? They do. Okay. So whatchamacallit, probably. I always love a, a good old-fashioned Snickers. Nice. Okay. Favorite musical artist? Oh, that is a, oh God, that's a tough question. Of all time? You can only pick one. Taylor Swift. Okay. I will fight anyone all right. on, on that. I will die on that sword. We could do a whole podcast on that. And I'm willing to debate in my DMs, so hit me up if you guys have a problem with that. <laughs> Favorite cereal? Captain Crunch. Of course. Okay. Mac or PC? Mac. Google Gmail and Workspace or Microsoft Outlook and Office? Gross. There's only one answer to that. Gmail. Okay. 
<laughs> Dogs or cats? Dogs. Phantom or Les Mis? Les Mis, special place in my heart. Okay. Awesome. It's, at, it's in Salt Lake right now, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go see it a week from today. I'm going to take my kids. Yeah. I just introduced my kids to the soundtrack. Awesome. I could take my, do- my daughter, not my son yet, but. Nice. Uh, so where can people find you? Where, what's your socials? You can find me at Sierra.McCleave on all the socials, at Make a Dent Podcast for the pod. You'll see my tiny house stuff on my socials there as well. And then I'm pretty sure, yep, Sierra McCleave at LinkedIn. Not on LinkedIn too much. Need to be, but not. But you can find me there too. Awesome. So I'll include links to all things Sierra McCleave, Thirst Drinks, uh, Tiny House Rentals, and Make a Dent Podcast in the show notes. Sierra, I'm so glad Lynn Christian introduced us. You're a total badass. And I'm excited to see what the future holds for you. Thank you for being so generous with your time on this beautiful Sunday morning in Park City. I really enjoyed our time together. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It has been a joy and honor. Thank you. I always want to say bye at the end. It's like, it's a Zoom call. Bye. Okay, see ya. Bye. Talk to you soon. (laughs) Bye.